conference this morning for Bible class. Last week, uh, kind of picked up, even though Nathan filled in week and with week one for me, filled in for week one. Last week, we still kind of did an introductory lecture in talking about the Holy Spirit. And we did so because the Holy Spirit is throughout the whole book of Acts. And, you know, the, the lesson before that we taught, we had a, a thing up there. We changed it this time to put actions confirmed through the Spirit. If you write in your Bible, that's a good thing to write there above Acts. It's, it is the Acts to the letter to the apostles, but it's also filled with the Spirit as well. I did put handouts out. I don't know if you noticed this morning, but by the questionnaire, by the Q&A box back there in the back, there are two stacks of papers. There's one that has a conversion sheet on it that lists all the conversions in the book of Acts. There's also another one that has the layout for this quarter that we've designed and we kind of made it a little bit maybe easier for you to see on the screen this week instead of putting the whole thing up there we just kind of put a section of it but we're still on lesson two this morning dealing with the dawn of the church or the beginning or the birth of the church from Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two. We put in that category the word triumph and the reason we put that word there is because Acts really is the triumph of the scriptures with the new law. When you think about when you think about the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course, Jesus was alive during that time. He chose the apostles. He was teaching them day to day. And even though the crucifixion is in the gospels that we read of, it's really when you get to Acts chapter one that you see him after his time on the earth that he ascends back to the Father for good. And he's there until he will come again for his second and last coming to this earth. So that's why we labeled it triumph for, for chapters 1 and chapter 2. Because it's the birth of the church. It's the triumph. Everything that Christ has worked for, his work that the Father had given him to do of his coming to this earth living the obedient life, being that perfect lamb that could die on the cross for the remission of our sins, that work he has accomplished, that work he's completed, and now it's time for him to go back to the Father and then to send the Comforter. But if you wonder why we label those that, that's, that is the reason why we label that that way on the chart. We're dividing up uh, the Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> These may not be divided the way that you have in your Bibles or your Bible list different ways, but we're going to break Acts chapter 2 into seven different divisions <clears throat> this morning and also next week. <clears throat> I'm not going to worry too much about the schedule right now. We'll, we'll get caught up sooner or later. <clears throat> Excuse me. But think about Acts chapter 2 and think about how that it is divided you see there, we're going to talk about the entrance of the Holy Spirit from verses 1 through 4. We'll talk about the evaluation by the crowd from verses 5 through 13. We'll talk about the explanation of the event from verses 14 through 21. Then we'll notice in verses 22 and 35 the exaltation of Christ, how Christ was exalted in the first sermon that was preached. And then we'll talk about the encounter with the truth the entrance of the church, and the effect of the gospel it had on that day on Pentecost. So when you think about studying this week, this will be kind of the format that we go by, and next week we'll finish up this format, because I don't think we can cover all seven this morning. Uh, you think about Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 is probably one of the most packed, packed chapters in all the Bible. You know, you can think about Genesis 1, how much information is in Genesis 1, you think about uh, Romans chapter 8, how much information is in Romans chapter 8. You think about, I even think about Hebrews 11, we call it the hall of faith because we think about all the people listed in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, and you think about their life and where it played in the scriptures. You know, there, there's five or six chapters that are really seem like there's a lot of information built in, and Acts chapter 2 is definitely one of them. There's so much information there for us to glean from. Let's talk about first from the interest of the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, hopefully let's read verses 1 through 4 together. It says, Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, 
It filled the whole house where they were, or where they were sitting. So then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one set upon each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them other utterance. You think about these verses here, and this is the reason why we kind of laid the groundwork last week of talking about the Holy Spirit and how that He interacts with the Godhead. Because right off in right here in verse first four verses, we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But before we get there, well, in a reminder, we'll just say from last week, remember the three things that we talked about. The Spirit is His person, His position, and His purpose. If we can remember, if you remember those things about the Holy Spirit throughout all the Bible, but especially during the book of Acts, it will help you. But think about here on, it says, now when the day of Pentecost had come, you know, Pentecost, you probably can't see the calendar up there, but it has the month of Savan, or Savan, however you want to say it, as being when Pentecost was. That was late May or early June area. If you look over to the left, you can see where I have the Passover from Deuteronomy chapter 16 to verse 1. That is the book, that is the month of Nisan or the month, the month of Abib. You know, the scriptures tell us from Matthew 26, 2 says, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered to be crucified. So we know that Jesus is about to be cross, crucified uh, during this time. But thinking about this calendar here, think about also another verse, Deuteronomy 16, 1. It says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt by night. So we see here the Passover is in the month of Abib. And then we also know the Pentecost is what? The word pente is... I know y'all are all good Bible script. Y'all know more Bible than I probably forgot. But the word pente means 50. The Pentecost was what? It's 50 days after the Passover, correct? So if we take that we know from Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 1 that the Passover is in the month of Abib. Or you, you can, we won't get into the difference between Hebrew and Jewish calendars. There's a lot of information when it comes to calendars throughout, throughout time. That's a whole other study in itself. But you think about that month, go 50 days more, and that throws us into the month of Savan, which is the third month. So the Pentecost is somewhere in our time frame between the last of May and the first of June. I would say more so toward the last of May from what I've studied. So this is the time frame. You want to put what time of year it is that the Pentecost happened. It happened pretty much in the last month of May that we know of. You know, if you take these, if you take these things and you, and you, you know, I'm a common sense person. <laughs> uh, you know, as some people say, I've never had any schooling. But if you take the common sense part of it, the Passover and the Pentecost in 50 days, if Christ was crucified on the Passover, he, re, he was raised, he was in the grave for three days and then he was raised. So that's 50 minus three, that's 47. When he came back to earth after he was raised from, from the death, what? He dwelt with the, everyone, the disciples, and taught them for 40 days. So you take that 47 days and you minus 40 days from that, and now you have seven days. So when he told the apostles to stay in Jerusalem until you come on, until the Spirit comes upon you, wait for the promise, they were really there about a week. They were there about seven days. Uh, you know, I'll say approximate because I can't say exactly for sure, but approximately they're there about seven days there that they're by themselves waiting on the promise. So it's not like that they've been there uh, a month or two or anything like that. They've just, they have really just been there whenever our cross had just left them while they were still waiting. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 through 10, here we'll take just a moment, just as kind of a sidebar item, just kind of compare between the old law and the new law. Because we made the comment last night, last month, sorry, having trouble speaking this morning, so we made a comment last, month, last week about how the Spirit is very orderly. And when you make this comparison, you're going to see the order again of God, how everything is in an orderly manner. But in Exodus 19 and verse 16, it says, And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. 
And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people were in the camp trembled. And then look down at verse 18 of chapter 19. It says, Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long, it became louder and louder. This is the scene that you read about whenever God has given Moses the Ten Commandments, or the old law, as we would say. It was something that was very visible. It was something that God showed how miraculous that he was. He showed his great allness, we would say, about him. We see the same thing again with the coming of the new law here in Acts chapter 2. When we read uh, the verses there, we'll see that not only uh, the, some of the same things, you see how that he captured their attention with one, a sound, the mighty rushing wind. There was a symbol of fire where the tongues sit upon their head. And then there was a sign with the uh, apostles speaking in tongues. And we know that to be speaking different languages. They weren't uttering things that could not be understood, but they were speaking different languages. And we let the scriptures answer that question for us here in just a few minutes. But also notice the comparison between the old and the new law. The giving of the law of Mount Sinai was followed by the Passover by about 50 days. When you come to the New Testament, dealing with the new law, the preaching of the gospel followed Jesus' death during the Passover feast by 50 days. You begin to see a little bit of order, did we not, between the old law and the new law, how God presented it to us, the people, some similarities. Look at yet another one from Exodus chapter 32. In verse 25 through 28, it says, When the law was given that 3,000 people died, but when the gospel was preached in Acts 2, 3,000 people were born again, Acts 2 and verse 41. Is that eerily similarities? <laughs> it may just be me, but it's just, there just seems to be eerily similarities between the two. We see the order between God. You know, if you from, help refresh your memory from Exodus chapter 32 there, that's whenever... Moses was coming down upon the mountain, you know, and he had the confrontation with Aaron. It says there, because Aaron had not restrained them to, to their shame. And in verse 26, it said, Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and from the entrance to entrance throughout the camp. Let every man kill his brother. Let every man kill his companion and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about 3,000 men fell that day. We see there all those that were disobedient, God punished for their wickedness. But you see the similarities between the giving of the old law and the giving of the new law. Look at yet another one here with me. It says from Exodus 19, 16, When the law was given, there was fear. When the gospel was preached, there was rejoicing. From the back in Exodus 19 and verse 16, you remember there how all the people were in the camp trembled. When they saw, when they saw the wondrous works of God coming from the mountain, they were afraid. And they, they had a right to be afraid because they recognized how majestic and how powerful God is. If we were to see God's awesomeness today, if we were to see how powerful He was he come to us in the same way. We no doubt he would, would do exactly the same thing. We probably would fall down in fear too because we recognize that we are nothing before him except for the fact of being made in his image, of course. But I mean, as far as us personally, we don't compare to God at all. But in the gospel we're preached and there was rejoicing in verse 46 of our text this week and next week it says, so they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, and they ate their food with gladness and simpl simplicity of heart. You can also go back to verse 41 that we just had on the screen there a minute ago. It says, Then those who were gladly received his word were baptized. They gladly received his word. They were rejoicing. They were happy. So you see these, you see this order, orderliness, orderliness between the old law and the new law and how that it was given. It brings us back to Acts chapter 1 or Acts chapter 2 again. Pick back up in our reeling, dealing 
back in our reading dealing with the, the Holy Spirit. In 1 through 4, it says, And being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And he says in verse 5, it says, You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, as we mentioned last week, there's much discussion on the Holy Spirit and much on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, in all of our teachings that we do, whether they're public or whether they're private, we we'll always try to be very careful in the things that we say and how that we say them. <clears throat> because, you know, we're reminded that each of us have friends that don't believe as we believe. Each of us have not only friends, we have family members that do not believe as we believe. They've, they've made their own paths and made their own decisions. So anything that we teach, we never want to call anyone out by name. We always want to bring our attention not to us or not on them, but rather sign the light on the Bible and let God's Word speak for itself. And that being the case, there are some people that teach that without the Holy Spirit baptism that you cannot be saved because they believe that we are born in sin and that we can't know the light until somebody comes inside of us, until we have somebody come inside and show us that light. That's not the case. As we study the Holy Spirit baptism this morning, we notice that the power given through the Holy Spirit was their ability to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This knowledge or this gift was a special gift and it was only given to the apostles at this time. Nobody else. You go back and look, you can go back and look at chapter 1 of Acts when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit in verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. He's not talking to anyone else outside of the apostles. He's talking to a specific group. They were the ones that he's promising the Holy Spirit to come on. It's not the large group of 120 people that we'll read about a little bit later in Acts 1, but it's the 12 apostles. It's the 12 that he chose, and those are the ones who will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Think about the word baptized and baptism. Another sidebar that we won't go down at this time, we'll have plenty of time to talk about in the book of Acts, is the word baptism itself. It comes from the word baptizo, and it means what? It means to be immersed. It doesn't mean to be dipped. It doesn't mean to be sprinkled. It means immersed. It means to go fully under the water. We see that in Romans 6, as we'll get to it later, when Romans chapter 6, when it talks about be buried with him in baptism, that we are buried with him just as Christ was buried. We dove down in the watery baptism, and when we raise up, we raise up a new person, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Those are teachings through God's Word. The word baptism seems the same thing when it comes about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It simply means to be uh, fully wet. It means to be overwhelmed. Uh, Thayer says to be immersed, submerged, overwhelmed. So the Holy Spirit baptism is a complete overwhelming of the individual with the power of the Holy Spirit. We'd like to make one comment right here. This is a, again, if you write in your Bibles, this is a good thing to write because this is, will help you dealing with this topic. When we talk about baptism, Water baptism is a command to be obeyed. Holy Spirit baptism is a promise to be received. There's a big difference between the two. Again, water baptism is a command to be obeyed, while Holy Spirit baptism is a promise to be received. Nowhere do we read in the scriptures where we are commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We do read that we are to be baptized for the remission of our sins. But look with me in verse in verse, uh, John verse, chapter 1, verse 33. There he says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. This is John the Baptist talking about he came to baptize with water. His baptism was what? Not one for forgiveness of sins, but his baptism was one to repentance. He was the forerunner of Christ. His baptism was for repentance, not for remission of sins. But he says there, he says, The one who you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came, 
in Acts chapter 2 on the apostles, he came through the authority of Jesus. Without Jesus leaving this earth and going back to the Father, what, John 14 and John 16 says the Spirit could not come. But he came, what? He came on Jesus' authority. He came by Jesus' uh, command. Also in John 3 and 23, you see now John was baptizing in, baptizing in Anon near Salon because there was much water there. And then in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He says, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So we see this Holy Spirit baptism is one that's not commanded, but is one that is a promise to be received. And it's a promise made to the apostles. It happens three times in the Word of God that we know of. It happens with the apostles in Acts chapter 2. It happens with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 in his household. And then it happened with Paul in Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18. I don't have all the, have all the information up on the, the screen for you this morning, but if you want to turn to those places while we talk about them, that would be, that would be fine. But think about one here dealing with the apostles, that the baptism here given to these men that they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking in languages that they did not study, they were speaking in things that there was no way that they had that knowledge without the Holy Spirit's help. We think about Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 through 47. There with Cornelius, it says in verse 35, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. They come down in verse 38 and it says how God had anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Come on down to the end of the reading in verse uh, 44. It says, Peter, it says there that while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all of those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished and as many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter said, Can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized? What? For they had received the Holy Spirit just as we have. This baptism of the Holy Spirit, this baptism is a miraculous baptism. It's not an ordinary baptism. This is the baptism where they are overpowered by God's presence and by His Spirit. And they are able to work miracles. They are able to do speak in tongues. They are able to perform uh, prophecies, other gifts that the Spirit does that you cannot do, any other normal man can do without having the God with you. The third time, and it doesn't seem quite as miraculous, but it's also another time that, that we see it, is with Paul's conversion. In Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 18, remember how Paul was on the road to Damascus persecuting the church? Remember how that Christ comes to him there? It says in uh, verse 10, it says, Now there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas for the one called Saul of Tarsus. Tarsus. They come down to verse 16. It says, For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to, us, appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight, and he arose and was baptized. So he received the Holy Spirit through Ananias. And notice that this baptism began... You don't see all the miraculous works here with Paul. It's what we saw with the apostles or what we saw with the house of Cornelius. But we know that he had the power of the Holy Spirit in his teachings by all the things that he did through his work with the early church. It brings us to our, our second reading this morning, our second division. Or before we go there, we'll, I reformed this verse and reformatted this verse, and maybe you can see it a little easier this week from 1 Corinthians 13. Again, we'll cover this later, but is the baptism of the Holy Spirit for us today? No, it's not. Is the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit available today? No, it's not. 
it was it died out with the apostles with their ability to lay hands on uh, on someone and pass that gift on. But the people that they passed the gift to were not able to lay hands on anybody else. It was only the apostles. We also see in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, where it talks about that love never fails, but whether there's prophecies, they will fall, or they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether it be knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away or will pass away. And we know that that which is perfect is the perfect law of liberty from James chapter 1 and verse 25. When the Holy Spirit came, He spoke, He confirmed the Word, He wrote the Scriptures, what holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When He confirmed the Word, it says in Jude 1 verse 3, it says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to you concerning your salvation, since I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. When he once for all finished this word that we have in our hands, then there was no more need for the miraculous. Now we're able to study his word, to read it at our convenience. You know, we're very, we are so very, very lucky in the United States to have that ability. If you were here last Sunday night and you saw the, the missionary talking about the work that he's dealing with and he didn't want to place his calls, so we won't call names, we won't call places of where his work at, but it's very deadly work area. It's not a place where they can openly study and read God's Word. They can't put it in print. They can't speak it. I mean, he showed some pictures of people having their hands cut, people being killed. There were some graphic pictures. He said that he toned it down. They were still graphic pictures, but they were pictures that helps us to not put our head in the sand, but it shows us there are places in the world where People don't have the ability that you and I have to be able to openly study and obey God's Word. This brings us to the second part of our text, and that is the evaluation of the crowd from verses 5 through 13. We we'll look back at our, at our text here, verses 5 through 13. It says, Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews and devout men from every nation under heaven, and when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they all were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each in our own language with our, which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Persia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Christians and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they all were amazed, perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. We see here where the Bible explains what the speaking in tongues is. It's not gibber is just not something that cannot be understood, but it is something when they heard people speaking in their own language. Think about the different places that he mentions. This mount, again, doesn't do justice, but there's a list here of 15 different areas of where people came to Jerusalem at this time. We know that people were, uh, they had to come during this time because during the Pentecost because they were required to come to Jerusalem for, uh, for the, I go brain dead, but for the, the holy day. They had to come present themselves for the holy day. But these 15, these 15 different nations that are presented, they represent most of the Jewish people. And the scripture says in all the world, probably all the known world, was representative here at this time. So this is not something that was done, you know, under wraps or done without anybody knowing. Another popular theory that is taught in our day and time is that Jesus will come again. There'll be a rapture. And when he comes, it will be, you know, it'll be silent. And we may not know it. And some people will be left here while some be taken. That's not how God, we, we see the order already that God is working, do we not? When he comes, it will be 
every eye will see. When he comes here in Acts chapter 2, he doesn't come with part of the people. He comes when everybody is present there at one time to present their self for the holy day. He comes to present his word. So you see it's very, very important that every nation was there. But also you see that everybody heard in their own word, in their own language, the wonderful works of God. They heard what the apostles were saying. Then look at the last verse there in verse 13. It says, Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now there's always going to be people that try to minimize the truth in everything that we do. And it's, it's always been that way. It will always be that way. Whenever the word is taught, there'll be some who believe and there'll be some who mock. Everyone will not accept the teachings of God's word. It's sad, but it's still the truth. So, but it's a lesson for us to learn to think about how that we listen whenever we listen to the Word. When we hear God's Word being taught, are we listening for the truth? You know, Jesus said a couple of times in Revelations over and over, but He also said uh, through Mark chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then He said to them, Take heed what you hear. It's so important for us as we listen to people as they are teaching, even, if you, even as you listen to me this morning, don't just listen to what I say, but listen to what I say and do as, a, as the Bereans did. Read the scriptures daily to see if what I'm saying compares to this. If it's not, then don't listen to what I'm saying. If a family member you have is telling you something and it doesn't line up with what God said in his word, we love them but we can't listen to them. If we have a boss man or we have people we work with that teach something different than what God said is in his word, we love them, but we can't follow them. Our eternity, our, our salvation and our eternity is too important to rely on that. It needs to rely on what the Holy Spirit has worked so hard to give us and that each one of us has. Any other comments right quick before I go on. Class is almost over, so Ray didn't raise his hand, so I'll go on. It's good because I'm deaf anyway. I clicked it and we'll see it comes up. The third point here dealing with verses 14 through 21 talks about the explanation of the event. We'll take time to read all that because of time this morning, but think about the explanation of the event. Here's about where Peter almost starts. It's kind of like the prelude to the first sermon. Your, your Bibles may have it starting with verse 14, dealing with Peter's sermon. That Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice, said to them, Men in Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and, need, and heed my words, for these are not drunk. You know, they, they said they were drunk, and that's why that they were talking. They were talking that way. They heard gibberish. Why? Because they weren't listening for the word. They were listening with the wrong intent. They were listening to hear what they wanted to hear. They were listening to how Jesus put it in the way that they wanted Jesus to be put instead of listening for the truth. When we, anytime we come to study God's word, we need to always pray that we come with it with an open mind, without prejudice, Without anything else, we come an open mind and just listen to what the Word of God says. Sometimes we may need help applying the truths. Sometimes it's helpful to have a teacher who can tie things together to make it more understandable for us. But if we don't come with an open mind, if we come with our mind already made up of what it's supposed to be, then we're not going to accept it. We'll be just like those who mocked on the day of Pentecost. We won't accept it because it's not what it doesn't fit into what we think should be. So we just reject it. But they thought they were drunk, even though it was 9 o'clock in the morning. But we all know that 9 o'clock in the morning is not the time that people normally drink or normally party. Uh, think about also there in that text as you come down toward the end of it. He says again, men of Israel hear these words. Uh, well, that's on the next section. He goes in here talking about the prophet Joel and he's relaying part of the Old Testament of what is said there about uh, 
It says, And it came to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and young men shall see visions, and your maiden servants, and your maid servants, and I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders. All of these things that he is quoting here from Joel, all of these things is happening right now on the day of Pentecost. Everything that they have been looking for, all of their fathers and their fathers before them and their fathers before them, and they've been reading and studying for this day. Here it is before them, and some of them are not accepting it, while others are because they're listening with an open mind. But he's going back and quoting what they should already know that should be proof of what is being done is truth. You know, sometimes we need to be careful with that as well. We need to recognize that we need to be prepared before we receive God's Word sometimes. It helps us if, we're, if we study a certain subject before we go to a class about it, what? We get more out of it. If we come to class without preparation, if we come to class without reading the text, if we come to class without that pre-study, without that preparation, then what? We're not able to receive everything the teacher has prepared because we're, we're kind of behind. We're at the back of the class. We're back here trying to learn. Here is what the Peter is doing by showing the old prophecy. He's saying, you should know this already. This has been written. This is what our fathers knew. Where, you know, if you were prepared, you would know that this day is the day, all these things that is happening, is happening was foretold, was prophesied. Again, talk about the order of the Godhead and how everyone works together. Well, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but I'll say there were what, over 600 prophecies concerning Jesus. All of those prophecies in the Old Testament, every one of them came to pass. Every one of them came to truth. Those prophecies, they were prophesizing so that people could know who Jesus was supposed to be and looking for him and know who that he was. I think we'll stop right there. Next week we'll move a little bit quicker, uh, finishing up chapter 2. We'll begin with verse 22 next week as we'll pick up about uh, dealing with uh, the exaltation of Christ, verses 23 through 35. Appreciate your time. Sorry I studied a little bit this morning, but hope you were able to get something out of the class.